Section 3.5 Periodic Variations in Element Properties Let's start by looking at effective nuclear charge, Z effective. Now this is not an actual equation, you need to know how to use or, um, use or memorize or anything. It's just a general way of describing effective charge. So when we talk about effective charge, we are talking about the amount of positive charge from the nucleus that an electron feels. So for example, if we have a core electron, so a core electron that's really close to the nucleus, it's going to feel the pull from the protons in the nucleus very strongly. Those electrons that are close to the nucleus will feel the positive pull from the protons much more strongly than an outer electron would because an outer electron, it is repulsed by those inner electrons and it also uh, it feels some shielding. So those inner electrons provide shielding for the outer electrons, meaning that the more inner electrons you have, the more these outer electrons are shielded from the positive attractive force of the nucleus. So Z effective charge increases across a period. So as you go left to right across a period, the effective nuclear charge increases. This is because the core electrons remain the same. So if you look at lithium versus beryllium to boron to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, they all have two core electrons, that is one S2 electrons. So the core electrons remains the same. However, you are increasing Z. You are increasing the number of protons in the nucleus. So if you are increasing the number of protons in the nucleus, but you are not increasing the shielding capabilities, then the effective charge therefore increases as you go left to right across a period. Now why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because this shows a trend in the atomic radius of the atoms. So the trend in the atomic radius is that the larger, larger atoms are towards the bottom left. So as you go down a column, the atomic radius gets larger, and as you go right to left across a period, so from right to left, the atomic radius gets larger. So, so the largest atoms are in the bottom left of the periodic table. The smallest atoms are in the top right of the periodic table. So atomic radius, it decreases across a period. So we're going from left to right now. Atomic radius decreases going left to right across a period. Well, why is this? Well, think about what we talked about two slides ago. As you go left to right across a period, the effective nuclear charge is increasing because you are not increasing the core number of electrons which means you are not increasing shielding. However, you are increasing the number of protons in the nucleus. So if shielding isn't increasing, but the strength of the pole is, the effective charge increases. And if the effective charge increases, this means the electrons are pulled in more, closer to the nucleus, which makes the radius smaller. So going left to right across a period, the size or the atomic radius decreases because the effective nuclear charge is increasing. The reverse happens when you go down a group or when you go down a column. So as you're going down a column, yes, the number of elect or the number of protons in the nucleus are increasing, but you are adding additional layers or levels of electrons. So as you add additional levels or layers of electrons, you drastically increase the number of core electrons, which increases the shielding. So this overcomes the gr um, greater number of protons in the nucleus and it increases the atomic radius. So as you go down a column, the atomic radius increases because there are n you are at a higher energy level, the electrons are further from the nucleus, they feel less attractive force, and there is a greater shielding. So more layers means the atom will be larger. So for example, going from hydrogen to lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium, going down that first column, the atomic radius increases. Same thing here in the second column, going from beryllium down to radium. All right, let's try a knowledge check question. Arrange the elements copper, silicon, francium, and calcium in order of increasing atomic radius. Okay, the correct answer is A. Silicon is the smallest, followed by copper, then calcium, then francium. Let's look at that in the periodic table. 
So you'd want to locate the four elements, francium, calcium, copper, and silicon. Silicon is closest to the top right, so it's going to be the smallest. Francium is closest to the bottom left, it's the largest, and then in between calcium and copper. So they are in the same period, the same row, but calcium is furthest less left, so calcium is largest. So silicon, copper, calcium, francium. All right, now let's talk about ionic radius. So ionic radius depends on whether the ion is a cation or an anion. So here we're talking about the radius of an ion, either a cation or an anion. Now generally, metals like aluminum will form cations with a positive charge and non-metals like sulfur will form anions with a negative charge. So one thing to note here is that cations are always smaller than the neutral atom whereas anions are always larger than the neutral atom. So the aluminum cation is smaller than neutral aluminum whereas the sulfur anion is larger than neutral sulfur. So cations are smaller than the neutral atom, anions are larger than the neutral atom. All right, and that is described here. So within a category such as cations, the ionic radius, it follows the same trend, right? Larger and lower is, larger equals lower and left. However, comparing cations to anions is difficult. It's like comparing apples and oranges. The only time you can ever compare cations and anions is if you are dealing with an isoelectronic set of ions. That means they have the same number of electrons. So let's look at these examples here. So we've got lithium, beryllium, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, potassium, calcium, gallium, and rubidium, strontium, indium. So here we're looking at uh, second row, third row, fourth row, and fifth row metals. So the neutral atom is represented with the sort of lightish green brown uh, circle and the cation is represented with the red circle. So you'll notice in all cases the cation is smaller than the neutral atom because the cations have lost electrons which means the, those electrons now feel a greater pull towards the nucleus which will cause the radius to shrink. Here on the right side we're looking at some anions, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, sulfur, chlorine, selenium, bromine, tellurium, and iodine. So second uh, row, third row, fourth row, and fifth row, some anions here, some non-metals. So the neutral atom is again represented by that light green-ish circle. And then the anions are represented by this sort of blue circle. So again, in all cases, the anion is larger than the neutral atom because with anions, you have now gained electrons. Now there are more electrons in those orbitals, which causes the electron-electron repulsive for, uh, forces to increase. So the electrons move further away from each other and the radius increases. So this is described a little more succinctly here. Cations smaller than neutral because of the increased electrostatic attraction. Protons can now more easily pull on the electrons, which shrinks the radius. With anions, they are larger than neutral because of the increased electron-electron repuls uh, repulsions. Electrons get further away from one another, which causes the radius to increase. All right, quick, quick knowledge check question. Which has a greater radius, oxygen or the oxygen two minus anion? All right, and correct answer is B, O two minus. All right, now let's talk about ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy required to remove an electron in the gas phase. The result is a cation with an overall positive charge. Now in general, when we're gonna talk about ionization energy, we are not specifically talking about gases. I just wanna specify that the actual ionization energy values are based upon gases because it's much easier to separate an individual atom with gases and to measure the exact ionization energy. So ionization energy again is the amount of energy required to remove an electron. The result is a cation with an overall positive charge. So for example, sodium, you got neutral sodium and you want to remove an electron from it to form the sodium cation. This would take 496 kilojoules of energy. So let's look at the trend here. The trend is the reverse of the atomic radius. So, uh, the smallest numbers, these are small energy values, which means it requires less energy to remove an electron, or it is easier to remove an electron. So those are towards the lower left. Towards the top right, these are the larger numbers. 
This means it requires more energy to remove an electron. It is harder to remove an electron. So ionization energy increases going left to right, and it increases going bottom to top. You have larger values towards the top right, meaning it is harder to remove an electron from those elements. You have smaller values in the bottom left. It requires less energy to remove an electron from those elements. So ionization energy, it increases across a period. This is because if you recall, as you go across a period, size decreases. So when size decreases, ionization energy increases because those electrons are getting closer to the nucleus. They're getting closer to the nucleus, which means more energy is required to remove the electrons, right? They're closer to the nucleus. They feel a stronger attractive force to the protons in the nucleus. So it requires more energy to pull an electron away from that nucleus. So more energy is required to remove electrons. You get the reverse trend going down a group. Right? As you go down a group, the atoms are getting bigger. So as the atoms are getting bigger, those outer electrons are further and further away from the nucleus, which means there is less attractive force, thus making them easier to remove and a lower energy is required. So for example, looking at the noble gases, as you go from helium down to radon, ionization energy decreases because the atoms are getting larger and thus those outer electrons are farther away from the nucleus and they feel less attractive force. So they require less energy to remove. Now there are two brief exceptions, th columns 3A and columns 6A. So look, let's look at from going column 2A to column 3A, going from beryllium to boron. So we would expect that going from beryllium to boron, ionization energy should slightly increase because boron is a little smaller than beryllium is. But what we notice here is that ionization energy, it actually slightly decreases going from beryllium to boron. Why is this? Well, it is easier to remove this lone electron here from the higher energy p orbital than it is to remove this electron from the lower energy 2s orbital that is closer to the nucleus. So this electron is slightly easier to remove than this electron, thus the ionization energy decreases from Be to B. We see a similar exception in going from columns 5a to 6a, so I'm going from nitrogen to oxygen. Again, we should expect the ionization energy to increase because oxygen is a little smaller than nitrogen. However, the ionization energy actually slightly decreases from 5a to 6a. This is because it is actually slightly easier to remove this paired electron than it is to remove this unpaired electron. Now I talked about in electron configurations how half-filled d orbitals have a special stability to them. So if oxygen loses an electron, it will have a half-filled p orbital, which is decently stabilizing. So oxygen definitely does not want to lose an electron but it is slightly easier to remove this paired electron than it is to remove this unpaired electron because if nitrogen loses an electron here, well now it loses that half-filled p orbital, which it would not like. All right, let's look at multiple ionizations. It is possible to remove additional electrons in subsequent ionizations, which gives IE2, IE3, and so on. So with sodium, the first ionization takes neutral sodium, removes one electron, the second ionization would take that sodium cation and remove another electron to give us the Na2 plus cation. You'll notice here there's a big jump from IE1 to IE2. So it is always more difficult, difficult to remove subsequent electrons because as you remove electrons, the atom is getting smaller and so the electrons are now closer to the nucleus and they require more energy to be removed. Now I want to highlight something interesting in this table here. Again, IE2 is always bigger than IE1, IE3 is always bigger than IE2, and so on. It is harder to remove an electron the more net positive charge it has. Now again, what I want to highlight here is what you notice down this kind of staircase, these blue cells. Here it's highlighting that it takes much more energy to remove core electrons than valence because they feel more attraction to the nucleus. So you notice here with lithium, it doesn't take too much energy to remove that first electron, but then we get a huge jump because lithium has one valence electron. So that first ionization energy is removing lithium's first valence electron. So if I try to remove a second electron, 
Now I'm removing a core electron, which is much closer to the nucleus, so it takes a lot more energy to remove that core electron. So this big jump going from this white cell to the blue cell all the way down the line here, this is that jump where you're going from removing a valence electron to removing a core electron. Beryllium has two valence electrons, so going from two to three, we see a huge jump because now we're attempting to remove a core electron. Or something like with oxygen, when you go from IE6 to IE7, IE6 would be the last valence electron since oxygen has six valence electrons. So this seventh ionization energy, now we'd be removing a core electron, so we get a big jump. So all of these jumps are when we go from removing a valence electron to a core electron. It is always easier to remove a valence electron than it is to remove a core electron. Okay, let's try a knowledge check question. Arrange the elements Mg, Cl, P, and Rb in order of increasing IE1. Okay, correct answer here is D. Rb has the smallest IE1, followed by magnesium, then phosphorus, then chlorine. So rubidium is the smallest here. So if we pick out these in the periodic table, rubidium, magnesium, phosphorus, and chlorine, remember that ionization energy increases from left to right, and it increases from bottom to top. It's the reverse of the atomic radius trend. So rubidium is closest to the bottom left. It has the smallest ionization energy. Magnesium, phosphorus, and chlorine are all in the same row. Magnesium is furthest left, so it, has, it comes second, then phosphorus, then chlorine. Chlorine would have the largest ionization energy. All right, one more knowledge check question. Which electron is hardest to remove from an atom having four valence electrons? All right, the answer is D, the fourth. Remember, it gets harder to remove electrons. The more, the more you remove, the harder it gets to remove them because you are creating cations. And cations are smaller than neutral atoms, so they require more energy to remove electrons from. So the fourth electron would be the hardest to remove. All right, last trend here. We're gonna talk about electron affinity. So electron affinity is the energy change for the process of adding an electron to an atom in the gas phase. The result is an anion with an overall negative charge. So this is kind of the reverse of ionization energy. Here we are adding an electron to produce an anion. Now, these electron affinity values, they sometimes are negative. So here, if we look at chlorine plus an electron to form the chloride minus one ion, so the chloride anion, you notice we have a negative electron affinity. This is because this is a stabilizing process. Chlorine likes adding an electron. It likes becoming an anion. So it gives off energy. This is why we have a negative electron affinity. This process gives off energy because chlorine likes to add an electron. So these electron affinity values are generally negative. However, when we talk about the electron affinity trend, we are going to say that it increases going left to right and it increases going bottom to top, just like ionization energy. So when we're talking about this trend here, we are talking about the magnitude, the magnitude, right? Because the ones in the top right technically are, quote, smaller because they are larger negative values. But we're talking about the magnitude here. So the elements in the top right have the largest negative value because they want electrons the most. So the lower left magnitude ones, the ones that have very small negative values or even positive values, they don't want electrons at all. So they have very small negative values or even positive values. So Again, my general trend for electron affinity that I want you to know is it's just like ionization energy. It increases going from left to right, and it increases going from bottom to top. Um, noble gases are an exception. Noble gases don't want electrons at all, so don't ignore that final column there. All right, knowledge check question. Arrange the elements S, E, S, C, S, and K in order of increasing E, A, 1. Correct answer here is C. So if we look at these in the periodic table, cesium is closest to the bottom left, so it should have the smallest magnitude electron affinity, then potassium, then selenium, then sulfur, which would have the largest electron affinity, or the electron affinity with the greatest magnitude. Sulfur wants electrons the most out of these four elements. Okay. 
That concludes section 3.5. I'll see you in the next video for section 3.6, the periodic table.